Hi, welcome to Emerging Future. Uh, my name is Benjamin J. Butler, and uh, today I'm joined uh, once again uh, uh, by uh, James Templehoff, the COO of BitNation. Welcome, James. Hi there. Hi, Benjamin. Well, thanks for uh, coming back um, after um, uh, last last time's uh, di dialogue, somewhat of a marathon, but I I, I think it was um, I think it was a useful dialogue to sort of give give the, um, the the bigger backdrop to the problems with the nation state and uh, kind of um, almost like um, clockwork, uh, we saw Catalonia blow up uh, uh, just a few weeks after our um, our recording, which seems to me a another manifestation of these uh, of this sort of ongoing war between centralization and decentralization. Um, uh, what what did you think? Well, uh, yeah, I think um, I think people. What's interesting is that people are more emboldened to say, "Well, if authority says to us." Um, I'm sorry, you can't do that. That we that we can say back to authority. Well, you don't have any authority. We can use a different mechanisms. We can use different kinds of. Uh, we can declare independence without uh, the need for that to take place within the context of the Westphalian settlement. So, what was very interesting about Catalonia is that they used IPFS. <clears throat> technology which we're using as part of Pangaea in order to help run a, uh, a voting system which uh, couldn't be taken down by, although uh, IPFS is less, um, uh, or governments can find a way to interfere with it. So they were using a decentralized technology and post the uh, independence vote, they have also declared independence unilaterally and also are now looking at things like cryptocurrencies and the Estonian e-residency model as a means by which to be independent whilst, uh, if you like, create, move out of the nation-state world and nation-state juris jurisdiction and have a sort of actually existing independence, despite the fact that authority is, uh, or the, the centralized government in Spain uh, is trying to prevent this. So what's interesting is people feel not only that they can, um, that they want more decentralization, but actually that they can find a new domain, governance domain, a governance domain um, uh, in you know, using decentralized, were built in decentralized technology, and they can actually migrate their independence to that domain, despite the fact that, they, that that's not being legitimized elsewhere. So it's giving people a, a place to exit. Mm. It's fascinating that two, two Italian regions uh, seem to be moving in the same direction as well. So, um, yeah, it's uh, very, very topical. Well, we're in between. I call the, 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 I don't know if I used this term last time, but the nation state is a bit like a beached whale. It's kind of caught between uh, two tide lines. On the one hand, you've got the soup, the, the globalized uh, and the globalization of centralization, if you like. And that occurred really accelerated during the 1990s with the European Union and and was already existing in the in the United Nations, but and then all the various free uh, uh, tr free trade areas that have been created since NAFTA and so on, mm -hmm. and then you have this uh, the super local, if you like, so where individual regions and cities and communities want to have more autonomy. So the nation states no longer you know, don't really fit between the two. So people are looking at ways in which they can come up with a solution which doesn't uh, homogenize further and centralize uh, governance to such a point that they even voice is going to be very distant, but to one in which they, and this is what we, when BitNation talks about what it's trying to do, it's, trying, it's not trying to give people more voice in a centralized solution. It's trying to give people more agency in their lives. So they don't need voice because they have the agency 
to act themselves. And I think that's what Catalonia showed. It wasn't a demand for more voice. It was a demand for uh, those, you know, the people of uh, that part of Spain to have more uh, um, agency. Mm. Well, um, I mean, that's why we've got you on today. Um, we thought we'd do a sort of two-part two part, um, series. So, um, yeah, um, I, I said you were a man with a solution, um, and um, that's what we'd like to talk about today. Um, ordinarily, we wouldn't uh, highlight one ICO uh, in particular, uh, but uh, I, I think yours is one of great significance to, uh, to, to these these big mega trends and, and also to the sort of e e ecology of decentralization. So um, we're, we're excited to hear about the mechanics of, of this new ICO, but um, also where you fit in into the bigger picture. Um, um, but um, first of all, um, I guess I'd like to ask you a little, little bit about the, um, the genesis uh, of BitNation and, and the, the team that's uh, masterminding it first. Uh, before we then go and touch on the ICO and some other issues. Okay, so um, Bit Nation was founded by my wife, Suzanne, and it comes, she really had the idea uh, sort of 13, 14 years ago when she was uh, really a teenager. And the reason where she came from is perhaps recognizing some of the things that took me a bit longer to recognize about the shape of the world. But I think driven by her own experience of her father being stateless, uh, his, her father, father's family were uh, Polish, uh, but of Jewish extraction. And in 1968, during the uh, Prague Spring, um, there was a crackdown on potential dissidents, including her father's family, who had to flee to Sweden and build a whole new life. And... They, it took them, uh, you know, years before they could get um, statehood. So in, in essence, they were lost in the system and had to uh, rely on travel documents and, uh, and really couldn't find a place. So I think her view of the world was very much colored by that experience and feeling that there's got to be a better solution to one where you could be arbitrarily excluded from uh, the global governance system and and I think more powerfully she felt that governance needs to work for people not people struggle to be governed so in that sense she wanted to turn the world upside down and, and say well you know governance should be provided by you know service providers should be providing governance to people and competing for citizens Whereas right now, it's pretty hard to, um, you know, citizens have to fight for the gov governance services they want, often amongst each other, as we discussed last time. And they also have to, um, uh, uh, the services that they get, they have to accept the services uh, which are selected by a majority. And so in some cases, I mean, in the most severe cases, that can mean that in fact, what the governance they get ex is excluding them personally from uh, 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 the services that they want because the majority doesn't want them to have them. So in the case of, for example, asylum seekers and refugees in Europe, that could be the case. And worse, in places like Myanmar with the Rohingya, for example. So her view was like, so how can we build this decentralized world? Initially, I think she saw it as uh, almost like a global insurance scheme. So a scheme in which insurance, uh, people could sign up and get insurance and through that, that insurance policy, they could uh, receive services from a range of service providers who weren't ne ne uh, necessarily um, anchored to the jurisdiction in which they lived. And then the, the big rev revelation for her was discovering blockchain technology or decentralized technology and understanding how Bitcoin ha was at its heart radically undermining the centralization of the global financial system. It was putting finances back into people's hands and because the bureaucracy, if you like, to administer a payment system 
could be done in a decentralized way. It meant that the fundament of centralized nation states, if you like, the thing that Louis XIV brought into government through by creating uh, you know, the first bureaucratic state, didn't have to be run by a central organization. It could be run by the swarm ourselves we could and not more than that the bureaucracy would be much more effective because decentralized technology not only does it provide a vast computing power and vast ability to uh, manage uh, vast amounts of, of information but it also enables that to be done securely so each individual has a choice about which information they share with others and which they keep, and what they keep to themselves and also um, as everyone says immutably because it's shared on so many computers it's impossible for a central organization to lose it uh, to have it hacked to um, uh, uh, change it or alter it so to de deny the truth of that information so from that perspective she suddenly realized that the you know the cent center of justification of government which is to run a bureaucracy to which to do things that we don't want to think about and so we can get on with our lives that can be done without a central authority or if you like the only authority is the uh, is the protocol if you like the computer itself is it the way it runs and the way it operates. And I think secondly, she also then realized that it's possible that there are more than one of those. You know, Ethereum was producing smart contract uh, functionality, which very simply means that this decentralized computer can run programs on it. But, but, and that those programs, just like the data that we would put on it, are equally immutable and can't be changed and, and, and so on. So those programs could then be used to deliver some of the services that people need and that are delivered by government. So if you take the old fashioned idea of government, a central authority developing a policy and then executing that policy um, across a population of people, well, and using a bureaucracy to manage the execution of the policy. Well, if you like, a decentralized solution to that, you have an extraordinary, extraordinary bureaucratic system, which isn't, doesn't need to be run by a group of individuals making a policy. It can be, it, it's capable of running any kind of uh, program or application on it. And those programs and applications can run any policy you like. So any individual could choose any particular policy that suits their life and have that policy provide them or as a program, as a protocol, provide them with the services they want. And that means that suddenly the world becomes a geographical. People do not, are not dependent upon geography in order to decide on the services they want. They can choose from a huge menu, which are run under an overarching uh, governance, if you like, state, if you like, in the sense that it's a, an effective bureaucracy, um, but which is a computer. So it doesn't involve people telling you uh, using that bureaucracy for other means, i.e. for abuses of power. So in a sense, you then have a very stable uh, bureaucracy. In fact, you can choose a number of them because there are competitors to Ethereum coming along and in the future we there are amazing multi-dimensional solutions like bit lattice coming along as well so you can choose among a series of states but actually what you're choosing is which one is the most effective bureaucracy you're simply choosing one that works as a really good bureaucracy and then within that what we're creating bit nation is the ability the human factor the ability for people to create communities which use those states to choose whichever states or as individuals to make agreements with them and access and use the services and create the services that get put on, uh, on into that state. So what we're saying is that almost uh, the need for uh, uh, bureaucracies being replaced by global 
computers that are not influenced by power politics and power dynamics and can't be uh, changed by individuals and organizations. And so we're then creating the ability for people to access those computers and use them to provide the governance services they need. And we start, we started right at the beginning with the most fundamental service, you know, which we think is uh, security and justice. So providing people with a jurisdiction in which they can make binding agreements, but making those agreements in a way which instead of being coerced to, uh, to comply to those agreements, uh, they can choose the nature of those agreements, either uh, um, the, the governing code of law or indeed the governing uh, bureaucracy, if you like, the governing blockchain under which they wish to <clears throat> make the agreement, but also they can choose uh, uh, the terms of the agreement. And as so long as all the parties agree to it, if it's a big agreement involving a whole na virtual nation, then it might, it might be, um, uh, you know, people might be willing to make a compromise, but if it's a one-on-one -on -one agreement, they can make a very tailored agreement with whoever. And then that, that agreement, um, instead of being, uh, uh, and once it's made, it's turned into a smart contract, so it's turned into a computer program, and that program runs the agreement, and so long as everybody does the bit, they get reminded by the, by the, uh, uh, mobile phone to do, to uh, whatever it is, if it's buying a car, to you know inspect the car, make sure it's okay, agree to sign off that it's okay, and then whatever, put the money in escrow, and then when everything's agreed, sign it. As long as that's all done, then what we do is reward people with reputation. And it's not reputation in the sense of that it affects the reputation for anything. It's very specifically reputation for uh, doing what you say. So in a sense, it's kind of like, reputation kind of like serves in the same way as the social contract in uh, Westphalian society. Because what it says is, uh, you will, your, your reputation trail, if you like, uh, through life will be, um, it, is a measure of how, uh, how much you keep faith with other people. So it creates a kind of new kind of social contract in which uh, people are rewarded for keeping faith. And similarly, we also, if there's a dispute, people don't lose reputation. They only lose reputation if they fail to resolve the dispute. And we also provide reputation, the system also provides reputation for the contracts themselves. So if it's a good contract, actually work pretty well, then that will get a higher reputation and more people could choose it. Or alternatively, uh, we also provide reputation for the ar arbitrators. So we have a human arbitrator. The whole point of BitNation is to bring in the human factor from the, if you like, the blockchain bureaucracy. And so we also have human arbitrators who can help to enable people to make agreements and they also get reputation for creating agreements. So if you like, you can see at one level blockchains providing and other things like BitLattice in the future providing a layer, a, a global bureaucratic or a choice of global bureaucratic states, which can provide all the bureaucracy we will ever need. So we don't have to think about that in our lives. And then BitNation creating the organizational and the jurisdiction, the legal, if you like, framework in which people can make cooperative agreements with each other and, and work together with each other uh, using those global uh, computerized bureaucracies to support, to deliver the services that they need. That was a bit long-winded, but that's the story of Bitnish. No, very interesting. No, very interesting. Can, 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 typical services being used at the moment and, and, and maybe some uh, and where this goes? Okay, so our uh, software is called Pangea. So if you like, Big Nation is the organization. The software we're building is Pangea, and that goes back to 2015 when Suzanne decided uh, correctly that 
having a jurisdiction, the ability to provide uh, security and justice uh, in the context of, of blockchain states, if you like, or, or in the context of decentralized, a decentralized bureaucracy was essential. And so the first iteration was to use, um, to try and do it on a blockchain by uh, trying to create a system by which people could make. But the problem with that is that blockchains are expensive. And then critically, what she understood is that people make agreements with each other by talking to each other through conversation. So the real technology that you need in, or in order to organize people and to make agreements with each other uh, in the context of these, the, this new decentralized uh, 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 future is is actually a chat, a, a smartphone chat. So the idea was to build Pangea around a smartphone chat, but a decentralized chat. And by that, we're really leaning towards a mesh network, if you like, a system in which people, uh, the chat is not controlled, centrally controlled, like Facebook or WeChat or WhatsApp, but um, runs, if you like, as a, ch as a message chain instead of a blockchain. So everybody has their chat on their computers and it can, as a mesh network in that case, it can also work offline, people using, um, using the uh, uh, Bluetooth connections between their smartphones and only one person being connected to the internet at any one time. <clears throat> you can still have networks functioning. And that's very good for developing world contexts, for example. So the technology that we've developed in the back end of Pangea is something we call Panthalassa. Pan Pangea, of course, was the first continent. And so the idea is to bring the world back together. And that's the motivation for Pangea. Panthalassa was the ocean that surrounded uh, Pangea. So if you like, they provided the food and sustenance. So we call the back end the under the hood part of Pangea Panthalassa. Um, Panthalassa began as a very interesting protocol called Secure Scuttlebutt, uh, being developed by a guy called Dominic Tarr in New Zealand. And then we, uh, our development team decided that uh, we needed to link to the international, uh, the IPFS, the uh, Interplanetary File System, which is a, a data storage system, also decentralized in order to make it work uh, with what we wanted to do, which was to enable people to write smart contracts and arbitrate write smart contracts. So what, so what we've done is developed um, a mesh communications network of our own from scratch called Panthalassa, which builds on the idea of uh, uh, a mesh communications network, but also adds to it the ability to store data better through IPFS. So what happens? So basically, what we've got our platform is a is a chat. People can just talk to each other as they would in a chat, but it's totally encrypted and it's totally decentralized. So nobody can take it down. So if you were in Catalonia right now, the government wouldn't be able to take it down or read what you're doing. And on that chat, you can create smart contracts, and those smart contracts can be voluntary nations, or they can be individual contracts, or they could be organizations in between and they then can be written to any of these blockchain uh, uh, bureaucracies to who will run them and operate them on your behalf so you won't have to think about them so that's what we're building a way in which people can be very human talk to each other communicate with each other make agreements with each other but then call upon the blockchain bureaucracy to do all the backroom work for them so they don't have to do that the things that the state and the judiciary and the legal system would have done for them or do do for them in the old world. Right, great. Um, perhaps we can move on to the, the ICO itself, and, uh, the, the rationale for doing the ICO and, and some of the mechanics that you, you, you think we, we should highlight. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, we have a we built a very, over the last year, we, we really made a transition to what we call Pangea 03, the, 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 mo the, the final version, if you like, the version that we're building now in January this year, actually between December and January this year. 
thinking it through and bringing in a new team of developers who initially came from our community and then we've recruited more and added more to them to build this. So we needed, we suddenly realized that we were in a position in which we could actually build something very effective, groundbreaking, world, you know, world changing quite quickly. So we needed to raise some finance. And obviously last year was ICO kind of, you know, uh, uh, craziness. So we also thought the time was right to raise some uh, 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 development funds to build this and, and promote it. So our, we don't call it an ICO, we call it a token sale because so if I can j just um, in the because we're using an Ethereum based uh, smart contracts get written to um, uh, to Ethereum initially we can also use an Ethereum based token and what the token does is that is how reputation is built so we have a uh, a little ecosystem of tokens, most of which, or four of which, are non-tradable, so you can't buy or sell them. But they move around within our software, within Pangea, and they're actually allocated by an artificial intelligence, an AI bot running on Ethereum. And what they do is they basically, if somebody fulfills a contract, they do everything they say, so they're going to get reputation, then the AI calculates it, actually it's cal calculated so in a slightly different way, but the AI gives it to you. So it's kind of the distribution system within the, the Ethereum uh, decentralized bureaucracy that's giving you your stuff. So the token, tokens do that, but what we also want to do is to incentivize people financially to, uh, for good citizenship, if you like, for fulfilling the social contract. So what happens if you, it's a bit like airline, miles you like me probably have flown around the world a lot you get all these air miles so it's a bit like that so if you build up enough of those at reputation at certain cutoff points certain milestones you will get some of our tokens some of the tradable tokens so you'll get some money put simply that you can use either to spend on the platform on governance services or to whatever to convert into fiat to you know pay pay for other things so the idea of our token is these internal tokens drive the four, one is for the, just for slightly different functions. One's for individuals, another's for groups, and another one is for smart contracts themselves. So the, so the idea of these tokens is that they provide a sort of incentive engine to drive the reputation system, which is our alternative to throwing people in jail. And punishing them. So they, people get incentives for fulfilling the social contract rather than being coerced for not fulfilling it. That's the difference in our world. So the token, but we've allocated a chunk of the tokens, about a third of the tokens to be sold. And the purpose of selling them is to raise money to build the, that. So we're in our, uh, our pre-sale, just a couple of days into our pre-sale right now, which is going pretty well. <clears throat> and we've raised about a third of our target for the pre-sale. But what we're looking to do is after the pre-sale, we will release the first version of Pangea uh, 03 or the latest iteration. And then immediately after the release, then we'll run a public sale to raise funds uh, to take that, build that version from what in essence will be a, uh, uh, an alpha through to the full beta, which will have full functionality. But the first version, which is we're very close to now, you will be able to create on uh, Ethereum using, uh, using Pangea. So we're, we're fairly, we're quite a long way down the path. We have over 100,000 lines of code and we have a big team working on it full time. So, so the token sale is really to allow us to accelerate and to move from being essentially an open source voluntary movement into a, a fully fledged organization to to deliver this well thanks thanks very much for in, for your insights and um uh good luck with the uh the, the token sale and hopefully we can uh, uh check in again at, at some point and um get your views on the uh the wider world and what's happening and, and also what's um what's going on at bit nation great yeah. very nice to talk to you again benjamin and also good luck 
And, uh, you know, I think your organization's really interesting. And I think uh, Emerging Futures and Pit Nation will be seeing a lot more of each other in the future. Great. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Talk to you soon. Bye.